Well, I was brought in in 1989 to be the evening host. So that was actually 8 until midnight, uh, Monday to Thursday, because on Friday nights we had um, additional programming. And I, it's safe to say that from 8 until 11 o'clock, it was um, a little bit focused on new music to some extent, and then uh, our regular kind of run of whatever we were playing at that particular time. And then from 11 until midnight, I produced and created and hosted a show called The Alternative Bedtime Hour. Okay. And that show was a little bit of a nod to freeform radio from the 70s. And what that meant was that one song could take you on an adventure into another song, could take you on to another adventure of another song. It was a journey. It was a radio journey. And it wasn't programmed by a computer or a music director. It was programmed by myself. It had a hint of uh, a healthy respect for the nighttime because it was from 11 until midnight, which I thought of as being kind of a magical hour, magical time period. And it included themes and poetry and stories and clips from listeners and concepts and was a bit of a mind bomb in, in the sense that it, it used the medium of radio to, to play a little bit. And that's there was a lot going on. That, you know, this, this, this show was happening at a time where at the station there was a lot was changing. It wasn't, it was kind of leaving that period of, um, you know, being alternative and, uh, and freeform even in a certain sense to a very structured, right, um, playlisted environment. During the time period I came in? Yes. Actually, no, it was a reaction to that. Um, Reiner Schwartz uh, was brought in in 1989 as the new program director, and he brought with him a certain amount of integrity and respect for local music, radio itself, and CFNY, because he had been on the station previously himself. And it also been in a very special time period with Marsden and others uh, at Chum FM and Shom FM in the 70s which was, again, that sort of free-form radio concept. So Reiner brought with him a whole uh, sense of integrity and philosophy and approach to radio that was actually counterbalancing what was going on at CFMY at the time, which was a little bit more commercial in flavor because it was playing, you know, Madonnas and uh, maybe more popularized remixes of tunes that were very, very important to that time period. So it was actually... A, a bit of a, a reaction to what was more commercial before it. Okay, so it was a bit of a transitionary period to, from, to, to back to a, having some of the elements of, of what was happening back in the 80s with the, with the spirit of radio. Mm -hmm. It was a bit of, it was transitioning a little bit back to that is what you're saying? I believe, yes. It okay. was a, a little bit more of a nod. There was, there was much more discussion, at least on my end, between the music department uh, and the hosts. Uh, you know, other great people of my particular time period, which was sort of 89 to 92, were people like Don Burns and Alan Cross was there and Hal Harbour was an important force and May and, 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 and all of the others. And, and if we talk about what the spirit of radio is, to me it's a really bold, strong connection to the host and what they're playing. It's a connection to the music. It's not a that was and this is and coming up and here's the time and, you know, let's get to that next track coming up at the top of the hour. Like, it's not that. It's, it's a real strong connection of the host to the song that is being played at that particular time. And I believe in my heart of hearts that that's something that the listener identifies with to this very day. And I think that, in essence, is what the spirit of radio is along with a bunch of other things, but that to me is the heart of it. And that, it, to answer your question, was kind of the formula that was floating through that particular time period. What makes, what made CFNY special to you? To me? Yes. Oh, um, well, as a broadcaster, I had already been in radio for three, four years doing campus and, and some other commercial radio. And I feel privileged 
to have been able to spent a, a, a prominent time there because it allowed me the freedom to discover who I was on the air. And I believe that the listener at that time, I, I could be wrong, but discovered it as well, whatever it is. And I, I, it was a hearkening back to its history. I grew up listening to it. I was, it dressed me. It, it you know, gave me my social life. I listened to the spots on the air and I, I listened to the music and those were the bands that I was going to see. Those were the clubs that I was going to. Those were the products I was going to buy. These were the people that were hanging on my wall as a teenager. You know, I've got goosebumps just thinking about it now. Like, so for me to be able to have danced in that world for three or four years and, and honor its past and try and bring a little bit of of spirit, magic, love of music to, to that radio station again is an honor. So I feel privileged. In that sense that, that you were able to present that alternative bedtime hour, mm-hmm. that you were, uh, and as you identified so strongly with it, you know, just growing up, mm-hmm. um, is that what you feel that made it different from, say, the competitors at the time, or not necessarily the competitors, but the other stations at the time? Oh, completely. We were still breaking music, which I think is a big part of, of CFMY's history. I mean, I was the first person to play Nine Inch Nails, and I was the first person to play Nirvana's Nevermind, and, you know, all of that, you know, great Manchester sound that came out of the early 90s. And being, I was lucky enough because I was in the evenings, and evenings was often a testing ground for new material, something that we'd walk into the record peddler that day, which is a prominent record shop at the time, and they'd say, this just came in from London. You got to hear this. I'd grab that. I'd take it to the station, and it'd be on the air that night. You know, that that was the commitment from from all of us who who were there, and to develop those trends and uh, be part of you know m- musical movements, whether it was grunge or Manchester or or pff, God, so many like uh, acid jazz or uh, any trip hop, any of those great sort of sub-genres of music that popped out of that time period, it was pretty prominent in its voice of CFNY at the time. Of course, there's the famous story where, where you read your, your resignation letter on, on the oh, air. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about what, what led up to that? Um, hmm, that's a really good question. <laughs> well, there was a change in the air. There was uh, you know, a, a change in ownership. There, uh, we had let go of some really um, important people to the radio station at the time. There was one day, I can't even remember how many people were fired, but you know, they were sent walking. And um, I, was, I was not happy with where I believed the direction of the radio station was going, and indeed it did go that way. Um, if I remember at the time, uh, I think I was being told that that 11 to midnight hour was now going to be programmed, and that, you know that was a hard thing to give up. Um, if it wasn't going to be programmed, I had a certain amount of tunes that I had to choose from with which to build it, and that didn't seem satisfying. I felt respectful to the so many people who had sent me their art and music and stories. I, I it was astronomical how much reaction I would get on a daily basis from people who were, you know, creating these wonderful pieces of art or work or photography or using it as a tool to go to sleep at night or however, you know, they they used that particular show. I felt honored that they had sent me so much stuff and I felt that in return I had to let them know that I wasn't happy, that um, that a change was, was coming and I wanted to do it in a creative way, <laughs> I guess. And yeah, yeah. What I did do, it wasn't so much my resignation, but that hour was spent asking people who were unemployed, and I don't know if people actually know the backstory of that, for their resumes. So I would record people um, before the show happened. I, along the, you know, the three hours heading up to it, I said, if you're out of work and you, you need to get a job, why don't you call me and, you know, write a little piece and we'll throw it on the air and see what we can do for you. 
So we had all of these great, <coughs> excuse me, all of these terrific, uh, you know, audio resumes from people that I had recorded, and I picked some of the favorite tunes of those last three years, and I interspersed those tunes with just these really great audio resumes from people. And the culmination of all of that at the end was that, well, I read my own, and that was the end. And obviously, from there, the station mm -hmm. became and has become a very, uh, very strictly formatted uh, modern mm -hmm. rock radio station. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel like that was the you felt that was the inevitable direction as you kind of saw what was happening? It was it was one direction. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, and and it just wasn't my particular direction at that time. I and I don't. I think that it's a it's a good question. I think that. Uh, it's important to acknowledge one's history, whether it's about the city itself in Toronto, because we're talking about a really remarkable radio station that really didn't exist anywhere else in the world. There was K-Rock in Los Angeles, but that was about it. Alternative radio stations didn't really exist. And to have that as, as a, such a prominent part of this city's culture, culture and history I think needs to be recognized. And regardless of how commercial you want to take you know, this format, I think there needs to be an element of, of acknowledgement for its past and why it is the way it is now and why it's so important to the history of Toronto and, and the world. Because none of those artists that became who they are you know, uh, ever didn't visit Toronto and didn't make it a prominent spot in its itinerary because Toronto was became a very important part of so many big music movements. Um, I, who's to say how it should be programmed now or even after I left? But I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's. I think it needs its uh, moment of recognizing where it's been and and how important that is.